So one of the things that I think has come to light in this year of COVID is the value that our culture and even our world gives to caregiving. And I guess we could say the lack of value that is given to caregiving in our world. But as I was reading the scriptures for today, I realized that I think this is a point that is hidden in the scriptures that we may not have noticed. Now, we tend to assume that it's only in our time that lives are overly busy and stressed and hectic and harried. But the story that we're reading from the Gospel of Mark is trying to tell us that even in their time, there was too much to do. There was too many people with too much need and not enough time to get it all done. Mark describes Jesus as being on the move, immediately going from place to place, from one crisis to another crisis. Here we read, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered Simon and Andrew's house, and right then, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. And he came, and he took her by the hand, and he lifted her up, and as the fever left her, she began to serve them, and then, that evening, they brought all of the people to him, all who were sick and possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many that were sick with various kinds of diseases. And then early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place to pray. And then Simon and the others came looking for them. And when they found them, they're like, what is going on? Everyone is searching for you. It's time to go again. I mean, he's just been baptized, returned from an uncomfortable wilderness experience, and now he is awash in people with all their needs and their problems and their pain. Now on this day, it starts with Simon's mother-in-law, and we tend to read right over this as if this was an insignificant detail, but I think it's there on purpose with a purpose. She isn't given a name, but her presence is important. For the first thing that Jesus does when learning of this woman's condition is to touch her. Victoria Lynn Garvey points out that Jesus touches her hand not simply to heal her, but to raise her up. And it's the same word that's used in descriptions of Jesus' own resurrection. Raising up is not simply a physical movement from prone to upright or even of healing. Her raising up has implicit invitation. It's an invitation not only to be healed of this particular fever, but to be lifted up from the many things that are pushing her down in life. But then, right after the fever leaves her, she starts serving her family and all of these visitors again. Doug Lee suggests that this is a move sure to raise some red flags for us. Simon's mother-in-law gets up from her sickbed and starts serving them like how predictable. No sooner is the woman healed than she's required to get up and start serving the men folk. But stepping back, taking another look, we see that that's not what's going on here. Lee continues reminding us that women in Mark's gospel, well, they do far better than their male counterparts. The men folk with Simon in their lead are constantly blurting out the wrong things. They're misunderstanding Jesus to the point that they run away and are nowhere to be found in his time of greatest need. But beginning right here with Simon's mother-in-law, the women continuously do what is commendable in Mark. The service of Simon's mother-in-law reflects the kingdom of God. She mirrors Jesus, you know, the one who came not to be served but to serve. Some biblical scholars call Simon's mother-in-law the first deacon of the church. And it could be that the first official deacons in the early church were men, not because they were more important, but because they needed to learn that serving was actually God's superpower. And the women had that figured out, sometimes not by choice. In the world in which we live, in this world, service is a term of jobs of inferior rank. 
servers and the service industry and service stations. According to this way of thinking, when we become successful, well, then other people will serve us. But the Jesus that we meet in the Gospels who did not come to be served but to serve teaches us that service is the higher calling, the highest calling. To serve for the sake of others is what it means to be Christ-like. And it seems through history the church has often missed this message as much as those first disciples did. Now, Emily and Amelia Nagoski are sisters and co-authors of a new book titled Burnout. They write about what they call human giver syndrome. Human giver syndrome is a collection of personal and cultural beliefs and behaviors that insist that some people's only meaning in life comes from being happy, calm, generous, and attentive to the needs of others. This is the unspoken but pernicious belief that some people are full human beings created to accomplish things, while others were meant to be givers, serving and meeting the needs of the real human beings. Human giver syndrome is the contagious belief that you have a moral obligation to give every drop of your humanity and support of others, no matter the cost to you. Now, if you think you might have human giver syndrome, it's not your fault. It's contagious and it's cultural. It's everywhere, though rarely admitted in public. It comes in the form of sexism, of complementarianism that says women were created to serve men. It comes in the form of racism. Some types of people were just born to serve other superior people. It comes in the form of classism. If you were born into the right kind of family, well, you were meant to lead the world. And if you were not, well, you were meant to serve the leaders. Now, Emily and Amelia write, when we teach college students about this, about human beings and human givers, we ask them, so what do you think? What is the solution? The first answer students tend to give is always raise everyone to be human beings. But what would the world look like in which everyone was a human being, a competitive, acquisitive, entitled human being? Hmm. One student blurted out, well, life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutus, and short, quoting Thomas Hobbes. If we raise everyone to be human beings, the result would be eternal war. But what if, what if we raised everyone to be a version of a human giver? What if we assumed it was everyone's person's moral responsibility to be generous and attentive to the needs of others? What if we assumed no one was simply entitled to have what they wanted from another person, but everyone was supposed to try to help others whenever they could? Well, when I read this, like uh, light bulbs went off. This is what Jesus has been trying to teach and trying to do and get at least his followers to understand. For he would go on to say again and again, the greatest among you will be your servants. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is what the kingdom of God was meant to be. Now, in this world, in our world, women have taken on the model of servant. People of color have been forced to take the place of servitude to more entitled people. Poor people are kept in poverty, working for long hours and low wages with no hope. But we have missed the message, the message that serving and seeking to meet others' needs is everyone's goal in the kingdom of God. If we all lived into that goal, this world would be God's generous, compassionate, beloved community. But then again, in reality, in day-to-day -day life, this kind of life isn't easy. Givers may spend years attending to the needs of others while dismissing their own stress and in response to all those needs that they see. 
The result is uncountable stress that accumulates in our bodies, an accumulation that leads to compassion fatigue, a cause of burnout, especially in those who are working in helping professions. Now, Debbie Thomas suggests that maybe, maybe we're the ones who have looked at Jesus from the wrong perspective. Maybe we're the ones who have turned Jesus into a magician who magically heals sickness and moves on unaffected and unconnected. Maybe if we look more closely, we'll find a Messiah who is deeply affected by the people he seeks to help and heal. Someone more complex than our quick fix culture wants to follow. Take, for example, Jesus of today's story, the Jesus who eludes the crowds and seeks out deserted places and prays in the dark and hides from his disciples till they have to hunt for him. If we just read too quickly through the Gospels, we might conclude that Jesus had a bad case of human giver syndrome. He gave and he gave and we rarely see him take for himself. But if we do that, we miss the example that Jesus gave us for how to live into this generous, giving, and compassionate, but exhausting love. The first thing he did, the first thing he did was run away. He took some time for self-care. He did have to wake up early before everyone else and sneak out of the house, which is a trick many parents have learned. If you want to relish a few moments of quiet and tranquility, well, you have to get up while the kids are asleep. But he slipped away from the crowds and even from his family and his friends. He slipped out into nature and he smelled the pine and the cedar trees. And he listened to the singing of the birds and the wind in the branches and he prayed. Although I don't think it was that on your knees, hands folded, dear God kind of prayer. I suspect it included a lot of walking and deep breathing and meditating and quietly listening for the spirit to bubble up with wisdom to meet the next day. Jesus gave and gave and he took time to rest and to regenerate his own body and spirit. He communed with God and nature so that he would have the strength to give that healing love again the next day and the next day. Now, as we continue to read this story, to look for these clues in the Gospels, we'll consider more ways that Jesus has taught us by example to live this life of healing love, to care for one another, how to create safe spaces for people to bring their pain, their needs, their hopes, how to be and how to care for caregivers. But for now, for today, let's remember this life, this life of Christ given for all, given for all of us human givers, for all of life, as we share the Lord's Supper together.